Okay. Well, I guess you can talk Well, should we, we can do this where we just kind of hold it between the two of us. Yeah, that's possible. That's what, um, there is, we had three speakers a couple weeks ago, and that's what we did. Okay. Okay. I'm going to go grab my cup of coffee okay. because God knows you need more coffee today. This is the last thing I'll be doing before I present it. Yeah, you can talk about it.
So thank you for coming today and listening to a presentation about the Portland Milwaukee Light Rail Project um, and our Willamette, proposed Willamette River Bridge. I'm Dave Unsworth. I'm the Deputy Project Manager for uh, the Light Rail Project and to Milwaukee. And with me, I have? Guinevere Milius, and I'm a Portland Design Commissioner. I'm a member of the Willamette River Bridge Advisory Committee, and I'm a partner at SRM Architecture and Marketing here in Portland. So can everybody hear us in the back? Great. And, well, yeah, raise your hands if you can't hear us. Thanks. Okay. We'll speak okay. up. Thanks. So when you leave here today, hopefully we'll have uh, informed you about three different things. The, what is the Portland-Milwaukee Light Rail Project, plans for a new uh, Willamette River Bridge, and part of the public process that we're going through in making a choice of what the bridge ought to look like in this location. So first about the Light Rail Project. Um, 7.3 miles from downtown Portland. It will connect into the Portland Mall that is scheduled to open up in September of this year. So trains would go from interstate all the way down to Milwaukee and Green Line trains potentially all the way through to the south. So exactly what trains go on there will be determined later. But at this point, we've identified 11 stations with one additional future station at Southeast Herald. About 2,000 park and ride spaces with it. Uh, there's a shared transit way that's proposed across the river, and that would include uh, uh, tracks for light rail, streetcar, and on the same tracks, buses would operate on it. On the side of that, there'd be two multi-purpose uh, paths on that, both each 12 foot uh, wide. And uh, we connect to a series of trails in a number of different locations, Springwater Trail, Trolley Trail, and the Greenway Trail. About 27,000 transit riders are expected to ride it per day in the year 2030, uh, 8.2 8 million per year, and we would create about 9,000 FTE or uh, full-time equivalent jobs in, uh, by the construction of it. You can see the uh, personal income generated, and there'd be substantial travel time savings from Milwaukee to South Waterfront to Portland State and to Pioneer Square as a result of the investment. And it would increase the mode split by 24% for transit trips coming to downtown Portland. Um, and as you well know, on the existing alignment, the existing light rail system, we've seen a significant amount of investment near stations and housing. And our ridership is uh, about 110 per day uh, currently. So why light rail? Why this area? In the next 20 years, there expect to be about a million new people coming to the Clark County, uh, four, four county area through here. Where are we gonna put them? How are they gonna get from A to B in ways that make sense? Are we gonna build a boatload of new roads? Or are we gonna try and do it with transit? The region has picked a choice of doing more with transit. This kind of fits in with it. The South Quarter is a quickly growing quarter, so those are kind of the, some of the purpose and need of the project. This is a picture of what could happen in the South Waterfront. It's not what you see today, what we're planning for what you would see in 2030. And really, it's the question of OHSU. They're investing a lot of money in a facility on the old Schnitzer site. So trying to tie all these things together with light rail and streetcar. Um, we've been talking with a lot of different people. Portland State growing its fall enrollment. OMSI's growing, OHSU growing, trying to tie all of these together. So with light rail, there would be basically a two-minute ride from Portland State down to the OHSU campus, a four-minute ride over to OMSI, a direct connection from OMSI to OHSU, which are, are, are partnering in a lot of different things. So there's some synergy with light rail being in the middle of that along with streetcar, getting people out of their cars, if you will. Uh, we just finished a draft environmental impact statement last year, and in July we picked a locally preferred alternative, which included a lot of different options of where was this bridge going to go, lots of public involvement, and this is the selected alignment. What really does, oops, it really ties into where the tram is down here and tries to tie into where we see a lot of growth happening up here and also the campus here at Schnitzer's. 
So let's see. Do I have enough leash here? Can yeah. you hear me in the back? Okay. Great. That's so the microphone. That's more for the tape. Okay. That's right. Okay. So we have. Uh, a city full of bridges, as you all know. Um, we have a number of different bridge types in Portland. Uh, you know, going through, we have uh, Steel, the Broadway, the Fremont, the St. John's, Burnside. All of them present different profiles, and they all behave in different ways. Um, all of them knit together to sort of form a picture uh, as you're moving down the river, through the city, on either the east or west side. And um, everyone has their favorite. Uh, St. John's, of course, is one of uh, is sort of the iconic bridge of Portland. Um, go ahead. Um, two teams were put together that involve members of the public that uh, essentially are helping guide the design process on this project. I sit on the Willamette River Bridge, uh, Willamette River Bridge Advisory Committee. Um, there's also a working group of technical staff and consultants that feed information into that team. And so they have been meeting with us uh, to present their findings as we move through this process. Um, so you see here the flow chart of, of uh, groups that are working on this project, the Willamette R River Bridge Advisory Committee that I'm on. There's also a citizen advisory committee that's working on the entire light rail alignment. Yeah, I think it's useful to note that there are a lot of sticky and political and um, questions that, if left to staff, we may get it wrong. So we ask uh, smart people, like Gwen and others, to provide advice to us on looking at design issues. For our view, the more eyes that can look at design, the more people who can prod us to say, hey, have you thought about that? Have you looked at that? I think we end up with a better process. So Metro, with the help of a lot of citizens, uh, we form these advisory groups to give us advice on things that we may not be thinking about, or a flavor of the public, or a different set of eyes that look from a different perspective on these projects. And I think it really, any process, any public process, really is better as a result of uh, these uh, advisory committees. Great. So members of the advisory committee include uh, representatives from the construction industry, from architecture firms, Thomas Hacker is a well-known architect here in Portland is on the committee. This building was actually one of them. Yes, this is one of his <laughs> buildings. Um, uh, Portland Department of Transportation, an important uh, player in this project, is, is represented by Sue Keel, who's the head of that department. Uh, Pat LaCrosse from OMSI, uh, myself, um, I'm a business owner in the uh, East Side Industrial Area, and as a representative of the Design Commission, I, um, I'm wearing that hat on that committee as well. Um, Carl Road from the Transportation Alliance has been a, a really valuable advocate for bike riders and also for pedestrians, and uh, those are the people that are really going to see the bridge up close and every day and, and, and get out and touch and feel the bridge, so it's important to have him. Dave Soderstrom is a, is a retired architect here in Portland, but he also represents the Portland Opera, who has an interest in how the landing happens on the east side. Uh, we have industry represented by Ross Island Sand and Gravel, obviously a heavy river user, um, Oregon Health Science, um, and then other developers and landscape architects have been involved and have not just been on this committee, but we've also had a sizable representation of the public who come and follow the meetings. And of course, the committee is chaired by Mayor Katz. I uh, have to mention that. She's, a, she's been a wonderful leader of the group, and it's been facilitated by the former director of planning here in Portland, David Knowles. He is, uh, yeah. He's now uh, he's a consultant with David Evans. David Evans and Associates, right. So. Anyway, we've sat through uh, a half a dozen meetings so far, this committee. Uh, and again, those meetings have been backed up by day long meetings with the technical staff who've gone through and done a bunch of work on budget and design, uh, different iterations of the designs, and then they bring their findings to us and we have a two-hour meeting on these dates. And um, any information that, that you'd like to find out about what we've been doing and what we've been looking at is available online. Uh, the the uh, findings of these, the committee and then also our meeting agendas and what have you are there. So I welcome you to go take a look. So. The real question for the group was, uh, what is the right bridge type? We selected the, what we thought is the right alignment. So what's the right bridge type for this location that really embodies Portland's aesthetic and functional, and can we afford it? So what's the right bridge for that area? What is the right bridge for the site and the environment that we're looking at, the river itself in that area? What's the right bridge given the budget for this project? So this is not just we're building a bridge. We're trying to get this project built all the way down to Southeast Park Avenue 
in south of Milwaukee. And why are we trying to do that? Well, we're trying to get cars off the road. We're trying to reduce vehicle miles traveled. Getting as far south as possible makes some sense. We set a budget for the bridge that we thought made sense, and that was a direction to the RBAC, saying this is where we think we ought to be spending for a bridge. What bridge types can we afford within that number? The successful bridge type needs to balance all three of those. It's not just what's the cheapest bridge. It's not what's just the, the best looking bridge. It's what's functional, what's the right aesthetic, and what's the right cost. So we hired? Uh, TriMet hired Rose Allison Partners, who is a bridge architect. Um, and uh, they have a, uh, basically a joint responsibility with HNTB, correct? Right. Who is the engineer. Um, Rosales has been a uh, really interesting design professional group on this on this project. Um, Miguel Rosales brings all sorts of experience with uh, both um, auto-oriented bridges. He's also done a really iconic pedestrian bridge in South Carolina. Um, he he brings a really great aesthetic um, approach to bridge design in a field of design where there isn't really a lot of fat, if you will. Uh, bridges generally don't have any parts on them that don't serve some sort of function in general. You can tack things onto them later and add public art and what have you, but as a rule, they are very lean structures. Um, and he's been able to deliver some really beautiful bridges that completely serve their purpose. So he's, he's been a great partner on this project. And he's actually been teamed with uh, uh, architect not an architect, but a structural engineer firm from Germany. So mm -hmm. this team in its own, Rosales and Partners, both have a local presence and has an engineering standpoint. But mostly the focus of his was from an aesthetic. Right. And HNTB is bringing uh, more of the hard-nosed structural engineering to this project and is working with Rosales to um, uh, make sure that the, the bridge types that they're looking at are, uh, you know, structurally sound and also, you know, we're going to work for us over the long haul. Both of these teams are at primes, and so in such, we hope that we have both the left and the right sides of the brain connected here. And it's actually, from my two cents, it's been an interesting conversation having two different perspectives coming to this citizen committee and providing advice to them. Um, so this is a reductive process. In the world, you can have thousands of bridges. You can have wooden bridges. You can have fiberglass bridges, but what you're really trying to do is get down to a very promising few alternatives. What are the right types of bridge for the right location? So we really essentially looked at a number of screens in greater and greater detail and more criteria as we move forward. We looked at trusses, arches, cable supported, movable spans. We looked at a series of different bridges and we started with a set of criteria and went down from that. But first off, there were a series of design uh, parameters and characteristics that we needed to set for this. This is a 1,720 foot span that we're going to cross the Lambert River in this area. It's a navigable waterway. Being a navigable waterway, we have to understand both the vertical and the horizontal clearances related to um, a bridge. Because this is Portland, and not because we're just TriMet, but we want to put bike and ped on that bridge. And with bike and ped comes some criteria from the federal government about America's uh, Disability Act, which says you can't you can't have a grade more than five percent in here unless you have ramps. So we're trying to make sure we provide enough clearance here, but yet easy enough for bike and peds to get in, and really to tie these stations that we have over at OMSI and over at the OHSU at a great way to make sure those stations fit well with the surrounding environment. We met and we spent a lot of time with the U.S. Coast Guard. We actually went out on a tour on a barge. We did a simulation of showing what a fully loaded barge would look like uh, in a, a fast moving water and would that, did that require us to widen the clearance that we did. And in through those conversations we actually did. We went from 500 feet to 600 as a minimum horizontal clearance in the river. And that actually the experience of going through and figuring out where they need to get a barge through and how wide that space needs to be was an interesting one for you all, right? I mean, there's, very it's very much threading a needle getting a barge through the river now. And so adding another bridge complicates the process and sort of added another layer of information for our committee as we were studying different bridge types. Things fell by the wayside as we realized we really needed to provide, you know, a slot this wide to get a, a boat through. Correct. So we 
obviously have a lot of criteria that we went through, and you can read through these. Uh, and, and below this, there's probably, for each one of these, there's a five or six subcategories. And working with our working group that Gwen mentioned, these day-long meetings, along with the uh, architects and the engineers, we produce for one item here. Uh, you know, this is aesthetic and architectural. Here's, you know, so this is just for architecture and urban design. Here's a list of criteria. How do each one of these uh, bridges rate? Uh, you know, how do they rank? And we provided those rankings back to the committee. And in the end, we went from the very many bridges you can have down to some bridges. So these were the ones that made it first through the, the really the, the ma first major screen, a wave frame, which we'll spend a lot more time talking about, a tight arch, a through arch, and two different cable stages. And uh, I'm going to show you some pictures here. Yeah. So we looked at tight arch bridges. Uh, there's a number of them around, uh, Sobe Island and, um, uh, let's see, the Fremont Bridge also represent this, this aesthetic um, through arch and tight arch, so some with the arch coming through down into a pier and others with the arch dying into the bridge. Um, some comparisons of how they looked on the river. You see the, uh, sorry, wave frame, the tight arch, and the cable stays. Um, looking from the west side from OHSU again, from the Greenway. So we really th thought about how things were going to look from the Greenway, and we're trying to think about how things look from a pedestrian or bicyclist perspective as they're passing under and by the bridge. From the opposite side of the river? Mm -hmm. That's great. We, wa we wanted to make sure that any bridge design that we created provided opportunities to get out and look at the river, to stop and to rest and to appreciate the, the beauty of the city. And so uh, the bridge architect very kindly provided us with some, some ideas about how that might look, although this is not finished, this is not set in stone. And then from on the river itself, so kind of on the river, on the bridge, from both sides, mm -hmm. how do you view this bridge? Mm -hmm. So we ended up as a committee eliminating both the through and tight arch for a couple of reasons. One, um, it's been done here in Portland. We have them. Uh, we felt like if we were going to add to a collection of bridges, eliminating this bridge type was, was an okay thing to do. There were also some real technical issues with this bridge. The placement of the piers um, ended up putting, putting construction work in uh, very dirty areas of the river, which was going to create environmental problems for uh, the construction crews. Um, there were other issues, uh, you know, the, the width was not as great as it could be in terms of getting boats through. There were issues with, um, you know, it wasn't cheaper. So it sort of became a, a type that we felt like we could safely eliminate. Our, our goal was to get down to about two bridge types, basically, and, and that made it relatively easy. So we ended up basically with three. Um, wave frame, a two-pier cable stayed bridge, and a four-pier cable stayed bridge. All of these bridges put two piers in the water. One of them puts extra piers on land. Yeah, two of them. Put two of them do, right. that's true. That's right. So okay. we're going to go through and talk about, and I've got more slides than I probably should have here, and Thomas is right again. <laughs> uh, one of the things that we got when we came back and presented the committee is we identified that the wave frame had high risk as we talked to HNTV and we looked at it from an uh, from owner's perspective, if you will. And so uh, I think one of the questions that came back from the committee is, gee, we kind of like that wave frame. Can you put more detail, more cost, and understand the risk in greater detail? So uh, we did. We went through, and when we were down to three bridge types, we really went through a structural analysis, understanding how each one performed under seismic standpoint. We really tried to define how you'd actually construct this bridge, uh, created computer models. We analyzed it for different loads. And we actually had a constructor group. Uh, this is a uh, a group called uh, National Constructors Group that basically provided us advice. Uh, a guy who's got lots of great experience and built a lot of these bridges gave us advice on how would he construct it and what are the risks that he sees, what are the costs that he sees. So it's great to have an architect or a, an engineer tell you what it costs, but if someone else has been there and done that a number of times, providing that advice I think was very important to the owner, which is TriMet. So we focused on risk. And the risk with uh, the different bridges are what is the foundation risk, the materials for both the sub and superstructure, how would you erect these bridges, what is the schedule impact and design risk that you see with these, with these bridge types. And I'm going to go through a couple opportunities and challenges with the different bridge types that are not all the risk, but some of the flavor of, 
uh, what we've had with the uh, committee. This is the cable stay two peer, and by two peer we mean one peer here and one peer here and no peers on the shore. And so under this one, it provides more open area underneath the greenway here as a result of it not having a pier here. And that's an advantage. From an opportunity from a life cycle cost, because less of this is con of steel, concrete doesn't need to be painted, doesn't need to be treated. It has a lower life cycle cost. So we're not just looking at the initial cost. We're looking at how much it's going to cost throughout the whole life of the project. The good, good news here is this more than exceeds our navigational horizontal clearance. Oh, and just real quickly, on these slides, uh, steel is represented in white. Right. And concrete is represented in gray. Which helps you understand life cycle cost. This is the largest environmental, largest horizontal clearance. But it also puts piers closer to shallow water. We're dealing with NOAA uh, fisheries and issues with shallow water habitat. What we're hearing is we need to avoid shallow water habitat, so piers in deeper water are better. Piers in deeper water start mixing it up with the navigational things. So they're, they're pluses and minus, and hopefully we'll find a sweet spot for these piers. Uh, it has the lowest vertical clearance, but it still exceeds the 75-foot clearance that matches the Selwood Bridge, which is two miles upstream. Uh, it has some technical issues about where these cable stays come down and where our catenary comes down. I think those are things that we can um, uh, successfully manage. And then the four pier, the difference between these are it has two piers in the river and it has a pier on the bank. So again, lower life cycle cost because more of it is concrete than steel lower risk um, because of the design of it, I think both the cable stays, and again provides adequate horizontal clearance. This one, because of where the stays are, may allow a little bit more flexibility of where you put bikes and uh, in relationship to the train itself. Its land side pier is closest to the greenway, so if you want, uh, you know, there's a pier here and there's a button 100 feet back here, so it's how that greenway looks on both sides has been important to some different folks. And then it is the widest over the greenway, 66 feet versus 69 feet because of the way the cable stays come down on it. Um, one of the issues that we've heard is height. Height. Um, so knitting, knitting the bridge into the space that it's falling into has been an important issue. Um, height certainly um, is a good thing or a bad thing depending on who you're talking to. Um, there was some discussion on the committee that the, uh, the relative height of the bridges, the cable bridges, would outweigh some of the buildings in South Waterfront, even though they're the same size when you're looking at them from a perspective of, say, the Central East Side or downtown, that the bridge might seem appear much taller than it really is in relation to some of the buildings. As buildings get closer to the bridges, of course, that will change. Um, also, there's some conversation about how the bridges knit in with other bridges in their vicinity. There's plenty of um, negative commentary on the Markham Bridge. People generally don't like how that thing looks. And, um, and yet, um, the bridges that we're proposing interact with it, with it in different ways, and in some ways, some conversation went around about the wave frame, feeling like it fit that bridge, its, its, its relationship between the Ross Island and the Markham was a little bit tidier. Um, I think the bridge architect says that the, the cable stayed bridges present perhaps a more aggressive profile, and, and, and they kind of poke up over the Markham Bridge, and that has its own value as well. But there's a lot of debate among those of us in the design community that are on this committee about which, which design value is better. So one of the things that we did, we tried to put the height of the towers in perspective to where the tram tower is. So you can see the tram given the elevation. And these are the, these are the allowed, um, with the floor area ratio, height limits for, for buildings that may go in the south waterfront. And they step back as you move forward and see the elevation of about 30 feet and how high they get. So this is the wave frame from the elevation above the, above the water. And you see the cable stage two, four and two. Cable stayed four because it has more piers. You're actually able to shrink some of the towers, and so that's maybe considered one of the benefits of it. Another thing is to compare it to what's out there today. So this is the steel bridge. The steel bridge um, has a height of its tower uh, of 198 feet, 187, and 210. So it kind of puts it in perspective to that, and then the height above the deck kind of similarly. So we're trying to give a flavor of, gee, it's a big tower, what's it look like? And it may, it, um, the very, very difference between the through trusses on the
steel bridge and what uh, a cable stay bridge may look like. But we're, again, trying to put in perspective, answer some questions, or at least give a perspective uh, to, the, to the RBAC committee. Waveframe has lots of opportunities and challenges. Uh, it embraces Portland's boldness of a, something innovative. Sure. It's, um, it's, it's a bridge like no other that's been built in the United States. Um, it's a different type of engineering. Um, it is <clears throat> essentially there's a prototype that exists in Germany, but <clears throat> excuse me, it's a closed bridge. This bridge has an open lattice work so that we can look out and, and appreciate the, uh, the landscape around us. Um, from a design perspective, some of the comments that, that, that the uh, um, committee members appreciated were the, the way the way frame sort of matches the undulating uh, landscape in Portland. It sort of fits the hilly perspective that you get, especially here from the west side. Um, again, the comment about it knitting between the Markham and the Rossland Bridge. I don't know if we have a, have a representation of that, but there were slides that the architect showed that for some of us, sort of had this, you had this moment where you're like, oh, that fits, you know, and then it feels like the right thing. And so uh, those of us that have been really excited about the wave frame, um, you know, have, have had the sense that this, this might be the right bridge for the right place. Um, another comment that has come out, too, is that um, many of the users of this bridge are going to be experiencing it slowly and on foot or on their bike, and that the scale might be kind of more humane and appropriate for that use. So that's also been part of our conversation. And, and I, at least my, I wasn't at the design commission, but I think there has been a split on the, the RBAC. Some saying we like this and some others saying we like that. And I, I think that's a great discussion to have. So what this also does, its piers are closer to uh, deeper water. That's a benefit for uh, shallow water habitat, getting those away from there. Uh, it's further from the contaminated material, both on the Zydell side and over here on the PG, the old PGE side. But it also has the narrowest clearance, which is acceptable, though. And I think there's an on-land pier issue here, too, yeah, right? And we'll, yeah, we'll get into that. We'll get yeah. into this. This is the one wave frame that was built and has built in a smaller span, much smaller span than 600 feet. And as you can see in here, these, uh, these ribs, and you've got metal in between it. So it's actually how this bridge performs, and I'm not an engineer, performs very different in the way it does. Uh, the architect believed, and I think rightfully so, this bridge wanted to be opened up. So the idea of taking this idea and getting rid of the metal between the webs was the idea of how you'd progress this. But it's a prototype, uh, and that is a challenge for us. Uh, there hasn't been another one built on this size and in this manner, and uh, it certainly will increase, we believe, the design and construction and engineering costs associated with it. So we went through and tried to understand those risks uh, from uh, reduced competition from steel fabrication. We're actually talking about four inch thick uh, steel. Uh, this is a high performance steel available only in one location in the United States. And the way you'd have to do it and some of the field welding that would have to go into it is highly, tech highly technical and may have some schedule risk for us. And the price volatility for steel, although it's been low recently, has been astronomical in the last couple of years. Don't know what the stimulus package may do to that. Concrete has a more understandable progression of cost for units. Uh, the weld inspections and uh, recoding and inspections that need to be done. The welding is really critical on how you'd actually construct this. So we've been spending a lot of time focusing in this We've actually gone out to Oregon Steel and Oregon Ironworks to talk about how you'd actually construct this to understand some of those construction risks. One of the other environmental challenges is this pier really has to be here given the structural, the structural integrity of this bridge. This is where we think some of the highest contamination is on an area that used to be industrial where ships were torn apart. And so that's, you know, it's one of the issues that we have to deal with. So in the end, we think that there's still a, a moderate to higher risk associated with the wave frame versus the cable stay. Why is that? Well, cable stay has been done in a number of different locations. It's a more simple bridge, if you will. Uh, the engineering issues, the fabrication issues, and we think it has a concern on schedule. All of those lead the owner to, to perceive a greater risk with this bridge type. So and then we get to cost. And I should tell you 
that this is that you're in a unique place because this is all part of a conversation that's still going on today. So we're still doing work on the risk. We're still doing work on cost. So, but as an owner and as a project, we want to get down as far south as we can. And cost is a big driver, as much of aesthetic and fitting the right bridge for the right location. So during this process, we actually revised how the design was. So we actually worked with the architect um, and different engineers to poke at some of the issues and some of the reasons the costs were higher before. And we've actually revised some of the design for the wave frame. We've also looked at the methodology and, and came up with we, what we think are maybe some smarter ways that you actually go through and construct the wave frame. We revised quantities uh, for each one of these. So this is a base unit built up cost estimate for each one of these done by people who actually construct bridges. And then uh, we looked at trying to define what the real baseline cost estimate for this project really is. And um, so in the end, in our, in our final review in process, that, that means that we're still working on this, this is what we're finding, that the budget we set for this bridge type selection for the bridge that goes across here that works for the overall project budget for the Milwaukee, Portland to Milwaukee light rail line, the four, the four pier cable stayed budget appears to be on budget. Again, these are all being revised. The uh, two pier cable stayed is more expensive and it is seven to $11 million over budget depending on how you phrase that. The, the way frame is 32 to $37 million over budget. And so that's one of the inputs that we have to bring through it. So if we're going to pick a bridge, we have to find out where that other money needs to come from and it needs to be balanced. So these are some of the struggles that the project is working through and going through on a daily basis. Um, our next steps are Yep, we are. So we're going to meet again. the the price The pricing is a relatively new uh, topic of conversation for our committee, and so we're we've been struggling with that over the design opportunities that we see. And uh, we'll continue that conversation on February fifth. And those meetings are open to the public. So if any of you are interested in in sitting in on that conversation, you're absolutely welcome to do so. It's three to five. Three to five at David Evans and Associate. You can take a streetcar down, and it's in their uh, Willamette room. Mm -hmm and the agendas and, uh, yes, watching time. Microphone. Oh, microphone. Sorry. Um, so 3 to 5, the Lamet Room. Is it 3 to 5, 3.30? 3 to 5? 3 to 5, the Lamet Room, David Evans and Associates down on the waterfront. You can take a streetcar down there from here. And then we'll take whatever recommendation our advisory committee uh, provides to the Portland to Milwaukee Light Rail Steering Committee. Steering committees made up of elected officials, Sam Adams, uh, Fred Hansen, our general manager, uh, Robert Liberty from Metro Council, um, and representatives from all of the local jurisdictions. So we really have seven local jurisdictions that are participating in Multnomah County, Clackamas County, City of Milwaukee, uh, ODOT, City of Portland, TriMet, Metro. I mean, I'm, maybe that's not seven, but that's a, no a number of people providing uh, advice and actually funds to the project itself. And then um, once we pick the bridge type, we are going to go into preliminary engineering, which means that we're taking it from a very conceptual standpoint. We're taking it up to 30% level of design. So uh, we're, at, we're actually at the very early stage of a type, size, and location study, if you will. But uh, we're ready to go. We're trying to pick the right type to move into engineering and spending a lot of more money on it. So I want to give you a couple more slides here, and I'll, we'll open it up for uh, comments. Kind of where we are on the overall uh, project schedule. We published a draft environmental impact statement in May of last year. We selected the alignments that we wanted and how far south of it we're going. We submitted an application to our federal partners for funding. And actually, it's not so much for funding, it's for the permission to go into preliminary engineering. Um, that was a nine foot stack of documents. Quite a lot of fun, let me tell you. Uh, and we haven't got the answer. We expect to get the answer, and it's been it's a glowing report so far, but we expect to get the approval to get into uh, preliminary engineering in February of this year. And then this February is basically, uh, uh, we'll spend a year, year and a half trying to get our designs up to 30% to reduce risk and get the cost right. And then we'll go through, and in the same time, we'll be going through a final environmental impact statement. Then through final design, uh, full funding grant agreement is essentially the contract we have with our federal partners of how much they're going to pay. 
how much we're going to pay, what is the scope of the project. And then if the clouds part, uh, you know, sun comes out, angels start singing, we'll be under construction by July 2011. Um, first thing that is on our critical path is putting piers in the river. And we have some in-water construction windows that we need to meet. And so we're driving to that, making, and we're trying to make decisions quickly in order to make sure that begins. Construction and operation, uh, light rail coming here, right out front going down to Milwaukee could be opened as early as September 2015. So how much does all this cost? A lot of money. In this project, I've learned how to say billions. It doesn't sound so much as we're now talking about bailouts in the trillions. So uh, I can talk about a $1.4 billion project. We expect and pray and hope that 60% uh, of that is going to come through a discretionary pot of money called New Starts. It's for transit, fixed rail transit only. Portland and the team it has with Metro and the city of Portland have been extremely successful in competing against the Poughkeepsies and the Orlandos and the Atlantas around the nation. It's because we do a lot of land use well here. And I think because we have a regional NPO that really works and we make smart decisions and those decisions are based in policy and with land use. So we expect to compete well for those dollars. Uh, the rest of that local match will come from $250 million that was set aside by the state lottery uh, legislator, uh, state legislature in 2007 with lottery-backed bonds. We've got $72 million of flexible dollars from Metro in Milwaukee, and we'll be looking under every stone and every um, into everybody's wallet to figure out how we finalize the project local financing of this project. And that will be coming together in the next year. So that's really our presentation. We've taken, I think, 40 minutes, and we've probably got 20 minutes left for questions. So you got to press the, yeah, I think you have to press the microphone on the table for questions. Um, first of all, yay, cable stay. <laughs> right. uh, the other question I have uh, relates to kind of, if you think about the Selwood Bridge. Yep. Uh, with a new Selwood bridge? Sure. Uh, the question, I, if everybody heard the question was, can you combine it with a Selwood bridge? Why not do one bridge and replace everything? And we did. So we've looked at the key for light rails, the right, getting light rail to work is the right alignment. We looked back in the 1990s and the 2000s of, of going down the west side and going through John's Landing area and going across the Selwood Bridge and going down to Milwaukee. What we found is, other than a beehive of opposition and what are you doing to our neighborhood, was it didn't perform as well as some other options. And so in the, also in the 1990s, we looked at a number of different options of getting across the river. We looked at the, the Hawthorne Bridge three times. Why not use the Hawthorne Bridge? Why not look at, can you put something underneath the Markham Bridge? Can you put something on the Ross Island Bridge? And in the end, through all those analyses, we came back to our steering committee, and the steering committee said for all of these reasons, given the public involvement we've had, we think we need to do a new bridge. And then through the environmental impact statement, not only do we need to do a new bridge, this is, we think, the right alignment for it. Great question. It's been asked a number of different times. It continues to come up. Another question that has been raised is, why not put autos on that bridge? Uh, you got bikes, you got pedge, you got streetcar, you got buses. Gee, you got everything else on there. Why not autos? And and part of it is where are you trying to connect to? And some of the concerns about the South Waterfront area is, is how congested that area is, bringing more traffic into that. Actually, and the size of the facility that needs to be, given all the ramps and all the things, and it will overwhelm that district. And you'd have to double the size, at least double the size of the bridge. So the answer to that one was also no. Is there also an issue with shadow on the river? Um, a wider bridge Absolutely. would present more environmental problems in terms of fish. Absolutely. Uh, you know, the fish don't like shadow. Uh, right. So we're, or the fish that we're trying to protect don't like the shadow. Right. So we're, we're um, having to constrain the width of the bridge for that reason as well. Great. Thanks. Yes, sir. Um, I see that you're planning on moving three bus lines onto the bridge. Yes. Is there any uh, plan to increase bus service to that area or add bus lines to the new stations? Uh, so it's important to know that we are adding buses to this bridge. And so what we find is that when we look at the bridges, 
the buses coming across, it's the 9, the 17, and I'm going to forget the other bridge, 19. Those, bridge, those buses go across the Ross Island Bridge, and in congested times, they're actually very slow, working their way through the spaghetti in the south waterfront area. And so when we, we looked at, if we're building and we're paving these tracks, we can actually bring buses through there and actually see significant travel time savings. And so we looked at those, those three buses. What we'll do is we'll equilibrate those to make sure that those buses coming through there have enough frequency to handle the loads that we expect. The, the other question is, well, what are you going to do about the service that was on the Hawthorne, was on the Ross Island Bridge? Are you going to look at providing some additional service through those neighborhoods after you've taken out? And we probably will. That's a detail we haven't got to, a detail we'll get into as we move closer to opening up the project. You mentioned that the 75-foot clearance matches the Selwood Bridge. Yes. Um, and I, I assume there's nothing that low um, downriver. So are there any commercial industrial activities between this bridge and the Selwood that would be limited by a 75-foot height? Great question. <laughs> He's been spending more time than you would think on this. Uh, to build a bridge, we need to secure a U.S. Coast Guard permit. And that permit, unfortunately, happens at the very end of our final environmental impact statement. After we spent quite a bit of money, so we're trying to guess what the permitted height should be. In order to understand what that height is, we, we've surveyed all the river users and asked them how do they use the river, what height, what clearance do you need for your vessels? And that's a simple question. What the hard question is, is knowing what the water levels is. The Willamette River changes very dramatically. And even the harder question is, is understanding what global warming may do to both the water flow coming down the rivers and because there's not a dam between this area and the ocean, what are ocean tides and ocean levels doing to the bridge? So one thing we know is that between the Selwood Bridge and where we're proposing to the bridge, there are two industrial users. One is Zydell, uh, who builds barges, and the other is Ross Island Sand and Gravel. Both can, are expected to continue operations. We've met with the CEOs of both of those, and both of those have told us they're fine with a 75-foot height concern. There are others, so we also have to look out for future river users. We've heard testimony from Portland Spirit concerned about that river height. We've asked people to make the bridge 120 feet. Um, so the question is, what is the right height for the bridge? We think it's at least 75 feet. Does it need to go slightly higher? We're doing some analysis on global warming. We're doing some analysis on river levels to try and understand what that exact height is. We hope to nail that down in the next coming months. We may end up getting sued over it, though. So those are really difficult technical questions that aren't, uh, there's not a clear and objective standard to that. But we know that between there, between where we're putting the bridge and the Selwood Bridge, there isn't a user, an industrial user, that needs a height higher than that. The bigger, the biggest uh, increase in river use is are actually commercial vessels, tour boats, that are seen going up river and going up to the Selwood Bridge and maybe turning back. There was a conversation about navigability and, and the question of how wide, again, the bridge was going to be came in the middle of this process and it, from the point of view of my committee. And <clears throat> there was some conversation about, gosh, you know, Zydell might leave soon and Ross Island is talking about moving operations somewhere else. Do we need to keep this river navigable? And I think the answer is yes. Um, it's a public resource. It's um, uh, the cheapest way to move goods, I think. It, Next to rail, or no, and it, it surpasses rail. I mean, it, moving something down a river by barge is inexpensive, and I think that with the problems that we've been having locally with I-5, the the less amount of pressure you can put on our roads by moving goods by water uh, is a good thing, and we we want to anticipate that other people might use the river for commerce and and prepare for that. You can appreciate the higher the the higher the bridge is, the more the cost is. So we're mm -hmm. and the harder it is for bicyclists to go over. So, Rob. A web question, and that's about the ownership of and maintenance of the bridge, uh, whether TriMet would be the owner and whether they own and maintain similar sized or scale bridges. Uh, you want to buy a bridge? <laughs> uh, uh, we will own the bridge and we will maintain the bridge. Inspections of the future bridges, like all bridges uh, in Oregon that carry passengers over it, actually is inspected by ODOT. Uh, they get a federal grant to do that. So. Uh, we actually have a number of bridges that we already have. Um, if you ride the yellow line out to Expo, we have almost a mile long of structure there. Uh, if you, on the west side, we have uh, a couple bridges through there. We also have a two-mile tunnel 
Uh, on our green line, we actually have a number of bridges that we have uh, are constructing. So um, we're, we are, though, trying to understand life cycle cost, and that's a big issue for us uh, when we're looking at how that may equate to a, an annual sinking fund to make sure that it gets painted if it is uh, something that is of steel. Yes? Press the button. Oh. So I know it's much more expensive if you were to go underground, but was that something that was talked about when it came to the Willamette River crossing? Uh, that was something we looked at at early stages. As an order of thumb, a very, very dangerous rule of thumb, but if it costs A to go uh, at grade, you double that to go above grade, and you probably triple or quadruple that to go below. So. And it's really the question is, where are the portals and how do those portals work? So we looked at it uh, and decided that that didn't make a lot of functions. Essentially what you're doing is you're going up and then on the east, on the west side, you're, tr you're chasing the grade trying to get out of, a, um, out of a tunnel. And so there's some concerns with that from an engineering standpoint and a cost standpoint. Um, have there been any public surveys or anything of that nature to determine what the pedestrian and bicycle volume will be across the bridge? It seems like it would be fairly high considering the, yeah. the Ross Island Bridge isn't too friendly. That is a great friendly. question. Uh, I wish we had a better um, bicycle and pedestrian model because the width of the bridge is one of those things that adds cost and we've got right now two 12-foot lanes. Uh, multi-purpose lanes and people have asked us to extend that quite a bit and the cost of extending that is pretty significant. So uh, some of the things that we've done is we have um, peak hour counts on the Greenway Trail, Springwater Trail through there. Uh, we're, what we're trying to do is figure out a distribution and a growth of uh, trips on bicycle uh, and there's been a huge growth in trips in bicycle. So there's a growth rate, there's a distribution factor the harder parts have to do with what do you assume for the Hawthorne Bridge. Hawthorne Bridge is a lift span. It, it lifts and therefore you don't have to go up at 4.75 percent and come back down. It's actually not an easy thing to go up that high, if you will. So we're in the process of trying to understand the exact, what we think is a good, good number for future bicycle and pedestrian. And then we're using some FHWA calculations of volume capacity ratio for multi-use paths. So that stuff is in progress. If you've got a better resource, let me know. So, And that has been a topic of conversation. I'm a bicyclist as well as a motorist. And, you know, yeah. So those of us that have, that cross the Hawthorne Bridge on a regular basis, as I do, know that uh, when it opened, it felt like a very generous facility for bikes. And today, it feels a little crowded during rush hour. Um, and so... Our assumptions about how much room bikes and peds need to share our space comfortably are, are evolving um, as this bridge is being worked on. So um, I think that I mean, one of the things that we're looking at in terms of the design of the bridge is where do the um, ties or piers or you know where do things knit together so that one day you could expand the capacity a bit of the of the walkways possibly. Uh, you know we don't want to yeah. get there until we get there, but but um, allowing building in some flexibility for for future use, I think, is, is part of this conversation. For comparison, Hawthorne's 10 foot wide, this is 12 foot wide, and I think the Hawthorne Bridge, when I ride it, I'm always worried about the kind of the cheese grater, the potato grater, that if you fall in next to the buses, you're done. This would have a more of a, a, a separation, positive separation between transit vehicles and this, so mm -hmm. we're in that discussion right now. Yes. So I just, I just wanted to ask, are the, is the pedestrian path and the bicycle path shared? Multi-use shared path, yeah, two 12-foot okay. lanes. And one of the issues is if you have more pedestrians going up, if you're going up at 4.75 percent, bicyclists go at different speeds. So you've got the joy rider uh, who's kind of, well, nice view, and you've got, the, you've got the commuter going faster. And that's part of the issues with the Hawthorne Bridge. So, like... Being a bicyclist, I take the West Bank Esplanade and avoid the East Bank. A lot of people are, there's a lot of pet pedestrians, and people like to let sightsee. Well, they're not always paying attention to where they're going, where they're walking, and it kind of conflicts, I think, with a lot of pedestrians. It's and kind of a nice problem to have in some ways, but. but yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, we're hoping that the Belvedere will at least provide a place for people to really stop and get out of the way of traffic. Um, it uh, it's, it's an issue, and I think that it's, 
in some ways you can't design your way out of it. Sometimes we're, we're going to have to work on sharing those spaces together uh, as a community of bicyclists and pedestrians, but I think that um, we, do, we do need to be forward thinking about how heavily this facility might be used in the future. Like I said, well, Hawthorne felt generous. Yeah, it's a pretty heavily cycled area. Mm -hmm. sure. Yes. Yes. And I think there's a lot of pent-up demand for people that wish they could use Ross Island. So. I know that the Bicycle Transportation Alliance is actually represented on the committee, trying to make sure we get that advice through that. So, Rob, you had a... Another web question, and it's asking about diversion of traffic from other bridges, and I assume that's been part of the modeling process, but maybe you could mention sure. that. Well, we use Metro's travel demand forecasting, and for our Federal Transit Administration projects, we're required to look at 2030 uh, land use, 2030 uh, auto network, and transit network. So it really is incorporated in the modeling that we're doing. Um, generally, the, the bridges uh, are at capacity. Uh, so removing some buses from um, the Ross Island Bridge actually helps moving some vehicles off of there. With the 27,000 riders per day, we're actually reducing some of the demand uh, in the corridor. Now that not always is reflected on those bridges because there's some latent demand of people wanting to get across those bridges. So it's certainly taken into consideration through the travel demand forecasting modeling that's been done for the project. I think we have um, four more minutes. So. Um, I was wondering, you talked about the height of the bridge with respect to some of the buildings that are on the south waterfront. Um, in general, do the developers of the south waterfront see this as an asset or a liability to, say, their condo projects and different I development? Th I think overall it's, it's considered an asset. Um, there are a lot of people that wish it was easier to get to the east side um, via foot or bicycle. Um, I um, actually am good friends with the woman who runs South Waterfront Community Relations, and she's also a bicyclist from the east side to get to her work, and she is excited about having a, a better facility to commute. Um, there's a lot of excitement in that neighborhood for better connection to other parts of the city. And I would give you, <clears throat> I think OHSU, much like Portland State realizes, is investing a lot of money in parking spaces, and real estate isn't a wise investment of those dollars. And so they're very supportive of that. The amount of growth that is expected in the south waterfront, if you were not to have a 30 to 40 mode, 40% 40 mode split, would just blow out the road network. So in order for OHSU to get its development to level at once, it needs transit. That being said, uh, it wants the right design. Similarly for OMSI and that district through there, they want the right design because they're going to live with it for 100 years. Uh, the Portland Opera, which is right next to it, uh, very much their view will be changed by this bridge. So that's why they've been invited to the table. That's why they've been invited to provide advice to our steering committee on what do you think the right bridge type is, not us telling them what the right bridge type is. I think you could get, probably, if you were to survey each of the residents that live in South Waterfront, you'd probably get a different opinion. I mean, you, you get a, you know, another spread on which bridge is right. Uh, uh, there's lots of different reasons why each of those bridges is attractive to people. So there's lots of opinions, but I think overall everyone's excited about having it there. Will the streetcar loop be using this bridge as well when that is eventually open? And, uh, and how much has that project been uh, factored into this uh, study? Uh, we allow, <clears throat> obviously, we're working together with Portland Streetcar. In fact, we submitted the application for them to the federal government to fund it. And that is a project that would go from northwest Portland and is scheduled to go down to OMSI. It's in final design and hopefully gets there. Uh, so the connections onto the bridge, making sure the switches are at the right height, will be done. And so we're working with them on both sides of the river. So it's intended that streetcar will go across the, the bridge. As part of our application to the federal government, we didn't take, we didn't consider the benefit from a ridership standpoint that a streetcar would bring for a very complicated reason, but I won't, which I won't get into. But we've been working very, I think the point of the, my answer is we've been working very closely with streetcar to make sure that we haven't missed an opportunity in this location. So we've talked you out. That's good. Two minutes to uh, one or so. so 
Before we thank our speakers, just a reminder that next week, uh, Michael Wolf, one of our uh, graduating master's students, will be speaking on the effects of data aggregation on measuring arterial performance. So we hope to see you next Friday. And so let's thank our speakers for their great presentation. Thank you.